This webinar will provide the most up-to-date science, strategies, and recommendations to provide a point-of-care risk assessment for healthcare workers. Guidance will be provided to better inform healthcare workers to carry out a point-of-care risk assessment. It will also advise of the importance of the hierarchy of controls, which includes ventilation as a higher order control, along with appropriate protective personal protective equipment. It will reinforce the precautionary principle approach, which considers the three modes of transmission, aerosol, droplets, and contact exposure. It is extremely important that effective protection controls be in place to protect against each of these potential transmission exposure routes. In today's session, we will hear from four speakers. John Odike from OCAL will be, will be presenting healthcare workers' experience during a pandemic survey results. Kevin Hedges from OCAL will be speaking on the hierarchy of prevention control banding for COVID-19. Neil McDermott from the PSHSA will look at applying the hierarchy of controls with examples. And Sandy Jones from SEIU Healthcare will discuss a point of care risk assessment for healthcare workers. And Tony, if I can ask you to mute again. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. During the session, we will be muting everyone's mic and shutting off the video. We would ask that you do not unmute yourself during the presentations in order to avoid any of the background noise and distractions during the session. There will be a question and answer period at the, end of the session. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box on the right of your screen and the presenters will have the opportunity to answer them during the question and answer period. Now I'd like, you to, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, John. Since 1989, John Odyke has been an occupational hygienist with the Hamilton Clinic of the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. Prior to working at OCAL, John had a health and safety and environmental responsibilities for three factories and three cast iron foundries with a mid-size auto parts firm. John graduated from chemical engineering at the University of Waterloo in 1983 and from the McMaster University Health Records Methods, sorry, Health Research Methods Program. If I can, uh, thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is a presentation that was put together by myself and Peter Smith from the Institute of Work and Health, and I want to acknowledge all of his work. He did a lot of the analysis. It also had the help of the uh, COVID-19 ad hoc, uh, ad hoc uh, survey group, and I'll explain who they are. There are a number of uh, healthcare unions, health and safety reps, uh, people from uh, all over the province and other provinces, also a bit of international. Guy Potter, who's an occupational psychologist at Duke University in North Carolina, was involved, uh, as I mentioned, Peter Smith, and a number of interested academics and activists from Canada and the US. The survey had a number of questions asking about burnout, stress, sleep symptoms. Uh, the items in red are the ones we'll be talking about. Uh, I only have 10 minutes, so we can talk about everything. Uh, so there are two scales that we use to measure anxiety and depression of two uh, questions each, an acute stress scale, self-efficacy. And then we ask questions about uh, various protective equipment that people were using and how available it was and whether it was the right type. We also asked about preventive measures and procedures and training. And then there were a number of other scales that uh, we won't go into today. So as of June 23rd, the last time I downloaded the results, uh, we had almost 6,000 uh, participants who completed at least 70% of the survey. And uh, here's a list of some of the unions. You can see that the top union was the uh, BC Nurses Union. Uh, so we had good participation from BC. 
One of the questions we asked is uh, on a scale from one to 10, how would you rate your current level of fear about this whole pandemic situation? And you can see 11% of the respondents actually said it was as much fear as I've ever felt. The average was around seven, uh, the peak there. But uh, over or just over 82% had a level of five or greater. And remember that number, 82.3%. We also asked the question, how concerned are you about bringing the virus home to those you live with and, uh, and or your friends? And again, uh, extremely concerned was the top end of the scale and almost half of them mentioned it. And again, 82.3% uh, were concerned, very concerned or extremely concerned. When we measured, uh, uh, we asked people how many uh, patients there were in their organization that had uh, been diagnosed with COVID and almost 60% had at least one, but uh, somewhat disturbingly, almost 22% didn't know whether there was uh, an infected person in the organization or not. Um, then we asked uh, what type of exposure uh, people had if they had them in the workplace and uh, a third of them had direct contact with the patient and another 5% uh, were in the same room or 12% on the same floor. Uh, we also asked about the number of infected workers in the workplace. And again, a third had at least one worker who had been infected and more than a third didn't know. Uh, we also broke this down by various uh, occupations. Uh, so you can see that for instance, uh, maintenance and technicians uh, had the highest number of, of uh, COVID patients in the organization. Um, when it came to direct contact, uh, paramedics uh, had the highest rate, 88.8% .8 had direct uh, contact. And when it came to number of infected workers uh, at work, uh, social workers and technicians had the highest number this is interesting because there was a study done in uh, Britain, which also found that social workers uh, had one of the highest uh, occupational rates of COVID. And then we also asked whether they were tested positive and the ones that uh, had the highest percentage were the dietary aids followed by social workers and then professionals. Professionals meant uh, people uh, for instance, such as uh, psychologists or, or people like that. And uh, we also asked the question about fear and, and break, broken down by uh, the uh, job categories. We have counselors or sorry, uh, dietary aides uh, who were had the most fear and they also had the highest um, positive test. So they had a very justified fear, whereas cleaning had 7.3, uh, yet none of them were, were infected. When we looked at uh, the type of uh, experiences they had, direct contact was most uh, often reported from paramedics and technicians. Uh, contact with COVID patient outside the workplace was most often with cooks, cleanings, and social workers. Uh, being told to work despite exposure, uh, cleaning people uh, experienced symptoms similar to COVID contact tracing, which is interesting because these people are on the telephone talking to people about their symptoms. Uh, okay. We also asked about uh, protective equipment. Uh, first of all, we asked whether it was appropriate type and whether there was an adequate supply. And of the people who indicated that they needed the um, personal protective equipment, we asked whether the needs were met, not met at various levels. And when we compared the percentage that had uh, their needs uh, had needs and those needs were met. The difference between that is the unmet needs. And we look, we're going to look at that uh, in relation to anxiety symptoms later on. So 56% uh, had unmet needs regarding N95 masks, uh, 53 for surgical masks, 43% for face shields, and 33% uh, 
for eye protection. And if you break that down again, uh, you can see that uh, licensed um, practical nurses were ones that had very often had a lack of, uh, of uh, protective equipment along with uh, registered psychiatric nurses, RPNs. Uh, paramedics uh, fared quite well with having adequate uh, protective equipment. And we asked uh, about the adequacy uh, of uh, preventive infection control procedures. And you see the list in, below there, such as in screening incoming patients, uh, having symptomatic patients wear masks, cohorting patients, uh, et cetera, including uh, housekeeping and uh, ventilation. And again, we're using the same type of uh, scheme. We're comparing needs met versus needs not met. And again, here you see the uh, comparison of the two and the, the one with the biggest difference between the two is uh, personal hygiene facilities, such as lockers and showers, uh, followed next by putting masks on the symptomatic people, uh, housekeeping uh, inadequacies, and screening, uh, which is kind of uh, amazing since these are all healthcare uh, facilities. And finally, cohorting also, which, which is quite concerning. So we measured anxiety using uh, the Generalized Anxiety Disorder Scale, uh, GAD2, and uh, we measured depressive symptoms by the Patient Health Questionnaire, PHQ2. And again, uh, these are the average scores. What we found, uh, for instance, uh, cleaning uh, had high scores right across the board on, on all measures. Uh, technicians were also quite high. Uh, contact tracing was one of the lowest. Uh, the two outcomes that we're going to look at in detail is an anxiety score. If you scored three or higher, uh, then you clinically need follow-up for anxiety disorders and three or more for depression disorders. And 54% of the respondents uh, scored higher than three uh, for anxiety and 41% for depression, which is very high. And here we see the correlation between whether you have your personal protective um, needs met. Uh, for instance, the, the green bar is having 100% of your needs met and uh, the brown bar at the other end is having none of your needs met. And you can see how the anxiety level uh, increases by this. And we see the same pattern for not having the infection control um, uh, provisions uh, not being met. Oops, sorry. And we also looked at the depression, and the depression was not as uh, stark as the anxiety symptoms. But again, we see the same pattern, where we have 33% of those having 100% of their PPE needs met, uh, compared to 45% for those who have none of their PPE uh, met. And for those of you uh, who are some of these people who are being stressed, uh, there is help. Uh, there is a volunteer network called the Ontario COVID-19 Mental Health Network of volunteer people who work in uh, counseling and they're available if you go on the website, uh, somebody will call you and um, direct you to whatever help you need. So, and uh, thank you very much and I'll, uh, Stop sharing and turn it over to Kevin. Thank you for that, John. Uh, we will be taking questions. If you want, if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat box. We're keeping track and we will ask the questions in the Q&A. Um, and yes, we will be passing it over to Kevin now. Uh, Kevin Hedges is an occupational hygienist with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers based at the Ottawa Clinic.
Kevin also does volunteer work and has been the international president for Workplace House Without Borders International since 2017 and has been with Workplace House with Health Without Borders since its inception in spring 2011. After his first career as an industrial chemist, he became a certified occupational hygienist and a certified industrial hygienist and the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists and the American Board of Industrial Hygiene, respectively. Prior to his relocation to Canada and for about six years, he was a senior principal occupational hygienist with the Australian Queensland Government Department of Natural Resources and Mines. Since moving to Canada in December 2010, he has worked as a consultant with a multinational mining company, and before joining OCAO, he worked as a regulator in Newfoundland. While with OCAO, Kevin has also helped facil facilitate research for the McIntyre Powder Project as part of which is assessing if there is a link between exposure to McIntyre Powder, which is a finely ground powder of aluminum and aluminum compounds, and a neuro neurodegenerative disease and other diseases that may be occupational. Kevin's father passed away at a young age of 57 from lung cancer. He was based in South Australia with the Royal Air Force during atomic bomb testing, a firefighter with Bristol uh, Fire Brigade and a coal miner for about 20 years. Thank you and over to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you very much, um, Patricia. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I just wanna thank um, the OCO team the great collaborative effort behind this webinar. Um, you know, I really feel honored to be part of a great team. Um, so thanks everyone. And just um, to those externally, um, you know, Associate Professor Chen Ye Pon, who provided some feedback on this presentation along with Dr. Lisa Brosu and also um, Alec Farquhar, I'm very grateful to. And also um, the, fact, the fact is that Neil McKimmett um, and Sandy Jones are uh, co-presenting as well. So thanks to everyone. Um, it's a great team effort. Uh, so I'm going to basically talk about the um, applying the hierarchy of control to a point of care risk assessment for protection of healthcare workers. And I want to talk also a bit about controlled banding. Um, and if you think about, you know, the risk um, from exposure to coronavirus and COVID-19, I just sort of thought I'd put it in perspective here. And you can see the um, uh, where we are there. Um, Kevin, may I ask that you turn your slides into the slideshow so we can see them a bit bigger? Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Okay, great. So you can sort of see that the um, where COVID-19 sits, um, but that was actually uh, May 26, and as of 24th of June, it was 480,591. So. I just thought it would be useful to sort of look at it in, um, in, the, in the context with all the other pandemics. And really, I just want to set the stage here. Um, if we think about exposure, there's been a big debate about um, exposure to coronavirus in an airborne form versus a tr droplet form. So I just want you to think about that as I go through the slides. Um, so the World Health Organization, um, they tweeted uh, back in um, March 28th that you know, the coronavirus is, is not airborne. Um, and, um, but then again, um, in March 29, they said that further studies are still needed. Um, so, you know, uh, it is confusing. Um, and, you know, there's recently, there's been a no number of studies to show that the likelihood of it's being airborne is, 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 is greater. Um, but in any case, uh, when we're in doubt, if there's mixed messaging and uncertainty, we really need to think about the precautionary principle approach. Um, but as I said, this latest paper that's now been published as of June 22nd um, has, has got collectively this preliminary data suggest the SARS-CoV-2 -CoV is resilient in an aerosol form. So it is resilient and it is in an aerosol form and um, infected persons may produce via viral aerosols that remain infectious for long periods after production through human shedding and airborne transport. They do say that more um, more studies are needed, but I think this is kind of like a, a groundbreaking paper moving forward. Um, and just, you know, to think about, um, you know, uh, frontline um, healthcare practitioners, 
and just the the psychosocial issues caused by COVID and um, you know dealing with vulnerable populations and you know the mental health for the general population. And we're very grateful um, to all of our frontline workers. Uh, this is from the Canadian uh, website. Um, this is talking about, um, you know, the Canadians being considered high risk and also uh, who is at risk. And it talks about, you know, um, different risk factors. And, um, you know, there is now growing consensus about the spread. Uh, it seems now that the culprit is close up person to person interactions for extended periods, crowded events, poor ventilation areas, and places where people are talking loudly or singing in a group indoors where there's a higher risk. Um, you know, health agencies so far have identified respiratory droplet contact as the major mode of COVID-19 transmission. So it's really, you know, that most of the messages we're getting about respiratory droplet contact, but, you know, since the outset or even prior um, to the pandemic, there is evidence that the coronavirus can be transmitted through aerosols or minuscule droplets that float in the air uh, longer than large droplets and has gotten much stronger. And these aerosols can be directly inhaled. Um, so really, it does uh, reinforce the importance of the precautionary principle approach for all workers and their families. And um, this is just uh, from a paper um, talking about, um, it's just a well-known paper uh, where there's choir practice and it's just showing that, you know, from a, a single sort of super spreader, the number of um, the choir members that got infected from that, um, that event. It's really reinforcing the, that aerosol is a, a significant route of exposure. Um, and also um, ASHRAE, uh, it's a, an air conditioning, um, Association in uh, in America, North America, have actually stated um, transmission through the air is sufficiently likely that airborne exposure to the virus should be controlled. And uh, Lisa Brosio kindly allowed me to use these slides. So this is just talking about um, you know how we can be exposed, and we're thinking about you know the aerosols being in the short range. Obviously, um, there's droplets, but there's also the very small particles that can be airborne, that can be inhaled. But even um, as you think about these being dispersed and then also being mixed in the air and in the, the longer the longer range as well. Um, and if you think about an indoor um, environment, you know, where it's recirculated, it's really important that the recirculated air is cleaned, um, you know, using HEPA filters, for example, and allowing outdoor and ventilation, putting portable air cleaners in, using UV lamps and also the sunlight, um, UVC in the sunlight will also um, kill the virus. I just want to quickly touch on control banding. Um, so control banding isn't new, it's been around for many years, but it can really be applied to this situation um, around um, coronavirus. And if you think about control banding, it's really about banding the, the risks into, uh, into different risk levels, if you like. So if you think about red, you know, being the, the stop traffic like light, if you think about amber, you have to be very cautious and then green, it's go. So I think that's just a good way to kind of uh, show what control banding is about. Where do we put most of our effort? Really, we want to really put strong controls in red we want to be very precautionary around yellow. Uh, but the thing is, what we're dealing with here is we're not dealing with chemicals. We're dealing with um, bioaerosols, um, coronavirus. Uh, so, you know, if we think about the, um, how hazardous it is, we're thinking about, we think about virulence, infectivity, and pathogenicity. So doing a risk assessment is not that simple because each of those different factors need to be thought about. But what OSHA have done, um, the US Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health, they've simplified uh, the process by assigning risk levels to different jobs. I've just provided hyperlinks to the documents from those risk levels. What I've done is I've actually um, taken um, the different risk levels that you'll see along the um, x-axis across, along the top of the, um, 
the top column there um, at the top of the table. So it's low, medium, high, and very high. And then on the y-axis, if you think about the hierarchy of control, um, you know, eliminating the hazard as being the most effective and providing personal protective equipment being the last line of a defense or the least effective. And then we can actually fill each of those kind of squares in and put in what we really need to do. And obviously, as the risk becomes higher, um, there's certain things that we need to do. For example, we need much better ventilation um, as we go right of the matrix. And really, we should be aiming on the top right-hand corner rather than the bottom right-hand corner there, um, which really talks about ventilation as being an important control. Um, and I think we also need to think about infectious people as point sources, which is quite an interesting paradigm, isn't it? And that's what Lisa Brossu was talking about the other day. Um, and each situation requires an assessment that should also consider community transmission. Um, so, you know, there might be certain regions that um, the transmission is much greater. And if we think about healthcare workers, you know, containment, um, minimal occupancy, increased ventilation, training is pro in, in proper use of PPE is important. And obviously, selection of PPE as a last resort is very important, and for especially including fit testing of respirators. Um, this is um, from Dr. Dave Zork from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. And I quite like this table because it's sort of got away from job descriptions. It's actually talked about um, different criteria about different risk levels. Uh, as um, Patricia said, um, international president, workplace health without borders. We've ran um, six, sorry, seven uh, dedicated coronavirus webinars, um, and you can find all of the webinars related to the coronavirus on our workplace health without borders YouTube channel. And uh, Dave Zork does a very good job of explaining um, control banning and applying it to COVID-19. So you might find that a very useful um, YouTube presentation to watch. Um, but as I sort of started off, each situation requires an assessment that should also consider community transmission, um, which is in line with what uh, the LL in L matrix is talking about the factored community transmission into, into this table as well. And just uh, grateful to John Udick for pulling this together actually a day or two before this presentation. But it's just a good way to look at control banding, you know, about risk management um, for the different uh, the public health units, public health areas. And uh, where do you want to really focus attention? You want to focus a lot more attention in the red area. Um, where there's um, higher community transmission. Um, uh, this uh, researcher called uh, Margaret, Dr. Margaret Sestana, and um, they've actually, they're working on um, control banning methodology, but it's more for non-healthcare workers so far, but they do refer to OSHA guidance. And when you look at the OSHA guidance um, for healthcare workers, they do, it does mention engineering controls, for example, ventilation. Um, so just um, in closing um, and thinking about um, the different routes of exposure, you know, aerosol is important. Um, and also, you know, what this presentation will lead into is a, a point of care risk assessment. So, and Sandy will be talking about that at the end of um, the you know, the last presentation. Um, but a risk assessment should be done and it should look at the hierarchy of control. Um, so for example, in a healthcare working environment, um, in an isolation room, you know, is there um, ventilation um, greater than 12 hour L changes per hour and is there negative pressure in that isolation room? And, and obviously the precautionary principle approach be applied. And I think the, also the, the key message I wanna convey is, um, there was a doctor from Nigeria that presented through Workplace Health Without Borders, and she also spent a bit of time in Toronto. And I, I just really want to convey that it's very important for hospitals to either employ or engage in certified occupational industrial hygienists, because this is our skill. This is what we do. We actually try and, um, you know, protect people. We, we, we prevent exposure. So that's, that's our skill, skill, skill set. I just want to also uh, bring you to Dr. Lisa Brosch's presentation, uh, which was recent, and it, it gives a really good overview of um, the 
COVID transmission route. And I've also provided uh, just a web page there to Workplace Health and Headwaters. It doesn't cost anything to join, so please join and uh, listen in. I also want to um, thank Alex Farqua who provided this um, for me. Alex is a lawyer and uh, he's also on the board of directors with Workplace Health Without Borders. But you know, really um, with regard to point of care risk assessment, you should be you should be thinking about the whole hierarchy of controls. Um, but at, especially at a minimum, an N95 to a healthcare worker who's working in situation in a, situations with a significant risk of being exposed to COVID. This is your legal right. Um, your right to a high level of personal protective equipment is strongly supported by research that there is airborne transmission of the virus as well as droplet contact. This is especially significant for workers at close quarters with potentially infectious patients, even when not performing aerosol generating procedures. Um, all healthcare workers should do a point of care risk assessment before heading into hazardous working conditions. Um, that's me. Thank you. All right. Uh, Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, just to quickly answer the questions, yes, the presentation will be shared. It's being recorded and will be shared on the OCA website along with our presenter slide deck. Okay. And next, we're going to have uh, Neil McDermott. Neil is an occupational hygienist and health and safety consultant at Public Services uh, Health and Safety Association, the PSHSA, in Ontario. He has 20 years experience as a health and safety professional, specializing in safety, industrial hygiene, as well as leadership, management, and culture. Neil has worked extensively with health and community care organizations through his uh, consulting services. At PSHSA, he represents them on a number of provincial working groups and committees. Most recently, he provides COVID-19 technical support around PPE and other control measures for the CMOH and the MOH LTC Emergency Operations Center. In terms of education, he has completed an applied master's in science degree in occupational health sciences through McGill University. Neil holds both the Canadian Registered Safety Professional and Certified Industrial Hygienist designations. Thank you and over to Neil. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for that introduction. And uh, similar to Kevin, I'm um, very pleased to be presenting with such a wonderful lineup of speakers. I, I've been asked to uh, speak to the application of the hierarchy of controls um, to the elimination and minimization of exposure uh, to SARS-CoV-2. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that's a big uh, area to cover off in 15 minutes. So I, I've chosen to focus my talk more on the engineering controls. Um, I think people have a better appreciation and understanding of the administrative and the PPE controls. And so, and one of the big things with with putting an emphasis on engineering controls, it it does reduce the reliance um, of PPE as your main means of reducing exposure, and uh, certainly that's uh, an important factor given shortages. So I do work for Public Services Health and Safety Association. I do throw out the disclaimer that you know the views in this presentation are, are my professional part of my professional judgment and not necessarily the views of uh, Public Services Health and Safety Association. Uh, I just wanted to quickly start by just talking about due diligence and and how that that you know that certainly applies to to the situation today. And, and certainly people should, you know, taking every precaution reasonable in the circumstance, that's a, a responsibility um, employers and supervisors should take seriously. Uh, and then, you know, consult legal um, counsel where they're um, not clear on that. So it's more than a legal defense, it's a standard in which to judge someone. Um, and, you know, we, I, I, you know, in that part of that, um, my presentation there at the, at the beginning on the title, I talk about adequate prote protection. So to me, I lean towards, you know, we want to do more than just to provide appropriate control measures. We want to make sure that there's adequate protection for workers. And one of the big things that we learned uh, from the Campbell report was the precautionary principle. So where there's uncertainty or a lack of scientific information, um, which, you know, we're, we're still still evolving. We're still learning about um, 
we're still learning about the disease, how it's the disease itself, and and how it's um, its modes of transmission. So, so there's certainly um, a need for the person uh, for precautionary principle. And when we think about it in terms of control measures and the application of it, uh, where there is uncertainty, we want to err on the side of a caution and be prudent. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but yes, yeah, some of this content um, came from Lisa, Dr. Lisa uh, Braze's um, presentation at a hygiene conference. But I mean, all these things people should be pretty familiar with now, you know, when we're, and, and I guess um, when we're thinking about control measures and what to apply, we have to recognize these risk factors into our decision making, right? So as we select controls, this is, this is really something that, you know, you can't just gloss over quickly. You do have to appreciate that these do introduce additional risk, right? So things like health status, the degree of community spread, when you're in that close proximity, uh, regardless if it's droplet or airborne, you know, in that short range, it's, it's definitely higher risk. The longer the duration and how frequent the task, um, over overcrowding high density situations. So when we look indoors, you know, indoors with inadequate ventilation, but when you add more people in there, um, that increases the density and, and the concentration. Um, also, I've, I've got particular concern around small enclosed spaces. We don't always pay enough attention to that. So like on construction sites, you know, trailers, um, but this includes things like elevators and, um, you know, porta potties and, and, and worksite vehicles. Uh, you, know, um, I, you know, we could talk a lot about temperature and relative humidity, but lower temperatures and relative humidity definitely contribute to increased uh, risk. So we want to maintain those systems um, with um, mind of, of what ASHRAE standards have put in place and then obviously touching your face. These historically have been risk factors and I don't think we should forget about them. So obviously if you don't, or you don't have adequate PPE, that's going to, we see higher rates of uh, infection amongst people that if they don't, you know, have that appropriate um, um, purchase personal protective equipment, um, you know, poor hand hand hygiene, incorrect doffing practice, practices and frequent cleaning, disinfecting, sharing items, direct care. And obviously if you're, if you haven't, we haven't got our act together going into this, then this is certainly gonna show up in our response and our ability to respond effectively. And then clearly if we don't have the motivation, knowledge and understanding, then we're, we're we're not going to be sitting very well. Uh, this, you know, this data is coming from CDC. Uh, we see this in the news. We see articles written about it all the time. But I guess I just want to stress that when you do start to look at the assessing risk, you have to consider workplace risk factors or individual risk, risk factors as part of that. And then there may be a need for accommodation. So, um, you know, hazard and risk assessment, every organization should be doing an organizational risk assessment. We provide a tool on our website. Uh, but in addition to that, you have to take it to the next level and create an exposure exposure control plan. Uh, other words for that, and Ministry of Labor recently put it, you know, talked about a safety plan. Um, but yeah, there's different response plans. You know, there's different ways to frame this. Uh, you know, you can't just respond to what's happening. You have to foresee the hazard. You know, that's tied to our, our um, you know, understanding of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, well, you know, we part of it is, is starting to get a sense of how the job should be organized and the tasks and, and potential exposures. Um, Kevin mentioned, you know, OSHA and, and their framework of low, medium, and high and very high risk. So I think that's a useful tool. Um, you know, you might start off in a job occupancy, you know, at a, in medium based on a description, but then you might modify that based on these risk factors. And yeah, it extends beyond just four walls. It can be a vehicle. Um, and then you have to consider the available conditions of control measures, which is key to what the point of care risk assessment presentation that Sandy will, will speak to. And then obviously you determine if that's acceptable or not, and if additional control measures need to be put in place. This is a, a hierarchy of control model. You know, we've all seen this in different versions of it, but this is the one that's been extracted from CDC. CDC is a great place to go collect information and resources around COVID-19. So I encourage people to go back to that. And so they, they're stressing that, you know, more effective controls are going to be ones that are, are put on, you know, an emphasis on elimination and substitution. Hard to do with infectious diseases, um, but physical separation does go a long way um, to, to getting near or achieving that. Um, and then obviously engineering controls are gonna be much more reliable and effective. 
and uh, then you just kind of work work your way down um, the list. Uh, yeah, as hygienists, we've always done that. We're well equipped to do that. Um, you know, just you know, the other thing to remember is that you can apply these hierarchy uh, at the source, at the path, and at the worker. So you could isolate the hazard, or you could isolate the worker using engineering controls. And obviously, PPR is the last line of defense. So sometimes you, you know, we don't want to just rely on one control measure, especially with airborne precautions. We, we, if that is, you know, at play, we want to look at a combination of control measures um, to reduce the risk and not rely upon on that. So when we we think about, um, you know, in terms of elimination of the hazard, when we're talking about infectious disease, the closest you're, you're going to get to is this physical separation piece. Most of us, um, you know, it's hard to remove that from our work situation, especially in healthcare. But some of the ways you can do this and stay out of reach or contact of people is, you know, through pre-screening of patients and scheduling of appointment appointments, um, assessing patients through nurse um, advice lines, so redirecting them or or having them stay at home if they don't necessarily need to go um, into the healthcare system, and. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, when you're in the hospital or in a long-term care or in some healthcare setting, we don't always have to have everybody at the bedside. We, you know, we want to exclude the non-essential people and sort of combine and bundle those activities together, sort of limit those face-to-face -face encounters. And another way to do that, you know, is through communication with patients through alternative means such as telephones, video monitoring, video applications, cell phones, and tablets. So I've got a picture there just showing the use of technology of the tablet to have that person interact with a with a family member um, or it could be a healthcare worker. Uh, so now I'm just kind of now moving into the engineering control uh, aspect of this. Um, you know, so the, when we think about engineering controls, the two that, that most jump to mind for most people is the use of uh, enclosures and uh, physical barriers that are taking advantage of plexiglass. And some of these are full and some of these are partial, right? So, um, you know, if you look at the top picture there, you see uh, somebody who's created a box, a plexiglass box, and they've isolated the, the worker from the person as they do that COVID-19 uh, test protocol. And somebody else is standing, you know, let's say more than greater than two meters away. So something like that is good. It, it'll help for droplet precautions, but if there was a degree of airborne, um, you know, relative contribution to airborne um, particles, uh, they could migrate and start to build up uh, to some degree within that. So a, a better design would be to um, positive pressure um, that space so it's it's pushing um, any, you know, clean air is being flooded into the space and, and it's positive pressure pushing out. Uh, below that picture, you can see uh, that's actually um, a design, a seat can that was uh, retrofitted in for like out of Sudbury. So, they, you know, they seem to be doing some good things out of Sudbury. Uh, we see that the, on the left, there's a place where you can talk um, and, and do the initial assessment. But when you actually go to physically do the get the swab out, there's some holes there. And then the whole room, again, is pressurized and there's filtration um, there. So it's a way of creating, isolating and separating the, the worker from the infected source. Um, another, um, another thing that comes to mind that most people, and I think everybody sort of embraces, is that when you have a suspected or confirmed case, you want to do that in an airborne ice infection isolation room. So these isolation rooms with HEPA filters, and we want to definitely be doing aerosol generating procedures in these in these sorts of rooms um, because they're they're specifically designed for that. Older facilities six air exchange per hour, but more, all the new ones are being built to twelve air exchanges per hour. Um, here, I just wanted to show um, this was so in the bottom here. Look at this the bottom one first. We see a doctor from Taiwan. Uh, he he created this intubation air cell box specifically for U.S. healthcare workers. Uh, he's you know great concern there with the lack of PPE, and so that's uh, a nice little box got holes in it, and it really just provides protection just from the drop droplet route primarily. And and then somebody has taken this in in Ireland, uh, and they have uh, included a ergonomic sort of design to it. And then they've for, from the airborne piece of it. Um, they've created, they've, they're wearing their N95 uh, respirator. Um, so a combination of controls there. Here you can see how the, this one is not fully enclosed on the right. Uh, so it's a droplet bar barrier spray shield. And the thing about that is, yeah, you know, the, you know you can, if the room's sufficiently large enough, you can take advantage of 
uh, the ventilation system in the room. It also uses bags there that you put your arms through to sort of contain um, any potential, potential viruses coming through. So, so yeah, uh, Kevin mentioned ASHRAE. They said it's sufficiently likely. Um, there's enough evidence there to suggest that we need to take advantage of the ventilation as a, as a, you know, airborne route is a control, we need to control that. And so they're, they've been working uh, very hard um, to put out sir, all sorts of information. So ASHRAE is, is trying to give out information and provide information around effective um, means of controlling airborne route in an indoor environment. CDC also has uh, integrated this into their information. You'll see throughout my presentation, I provide links um, so that you can, you know, you can go back and find that information. There's a reference of papers at the end of my um, slide deck. So the first thing they want to make sure that people do is, is they're properly maintaining their ventilation systems. And that's especially true when you return to work and you haven't been running a system for a period of time. So lots of, you know, startup and um, key strategies and, and um, checklists and whatnot around proper ventilation. We want to use the ventilation system as effectively as possible. Um, we can also utilize room uh, portable and fixed HEPA filtration units. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about what expedient patient isolation rooms, but this is something that's being promoted um, when you're, you know, you run out of PPE or you're under massive surge um, and you've run out of these um, airborne isolation rooms. These are other rooms that you can set up to uh, fulfill a very similar type of control. And then there's also on the CDC website, they've got lots of research and information on ventilated headboards, uh, which are essentially local exhaust hoods. And then we can't forget the importance of using high suction devices and tools. And we see that in dentistry, right? They use those to sort of help control any exposure um, at the source. So in terms of properly maintaining your ventilation, like a lot of this stuff I could talk for hours on, but I just kind of have to quickly go through it. Um, but here, you know, the first thing you want to do is check the supply and return grills and registers and outdoor intakes to make sure they're, they're not blocked in any way. Um, then you're going to make sure you balance um, the air and provide constant air movement. They don't recommend you turning the air off. Um, where you don't have mechanical ventilation, then you're going to have to turn to natural to, um, ventilation to dilute it. But it, it's not preferred because you can't really control the air movement and it's, it's, it's not consistent. Uh, we want to, yeah, have that adequate airflow rate, and you don't get that with the natural. One of the big things that they really stress, you know, and you're, we're going to get getting hit with all this different sort of technical information around ventilation. But if, if you know, one of the things they really want to stress is the movement, you know, moving air through the direction from clean to less clean. Um, so they see that as even more important than air exchange rate. Um, but obviously, air exchange rate and mixing factors are other things to look at. So yeah, so you you know, you move air. Um, you can um, you know, turn air over, um, and you can and you can also filter the air. Uh, sometimes people call that air scrubbing. But mixing factor, yeah. When we look at this stuff, you know, we we assume perfect mixing, but that's not only really always the case when you have equipment and whatnot in the room. Uh, yeah, there's optimum temperature ranges. So if you follow the ASHRAE standards, you're going to be okay. So all the historic stuff, you know, keep your ventilation system between 40 and 60 percent. But it, yeah, it, definitely the virus is going to uh, evaporate out more quickly, and that's going to prolong its ability. Um, it's going to say, say if it started at 10 microns, it, it'll it potentially could go down to four microns, and that'll make it linger longer. The air and its survivability will increase. So, so we want to keep those temperatures like that, and, and also think about what happens when you remove the the relative humidity. You see your nose dry out, and makes you more susceptible to infection. Uh, temperature, yeah, meat, meat, mac, um, meat packing facilities. I think that's self-explanatory there. Um, okay, so in terms of um, the ventilation systems and making them more effective, you want to run these systems on, uh, a, you know, on a constant um, setting. Uh, you want to make sure if there's a variable air ventilation system that you put it to a constant minimum airflow. So if it's, so you take the minimum, set it to the maximum. We don't want it shutting on and off. Sometimes people that put venturi um, airflow devices in there to do to correct the uh, to control the the constant pressure. Um, so they they don't um, actually recommend uh, recirculation of air. Uh, so ASHRAE would prefer you know that if you would introduce 100% outdoor air if you can, and you see that in isolation rooms. That's what they do. 
And certainly when you have a, when you have a zone sharing an HVAC unit, it, it starts to recirculate it amongst other people and put them at potential risk. So we saw with SARS-1, there, there was a case where there was some potential spread through there. So they're, so they're just trying to say, you know, that, that if there is that risk that you don't want to be diluting it and then doing it out of the expense of, of shooting that around. Um, and so, so where that's not feasible, because, you know, obviously with temperature, you know, the, the heat and the cold temperature of our type of climate, um, and there's, you know, costs associated with that, then you start to, you start to look at um, filtration and UV, and those two sort of wanting to use those two in combination. So again, ASHRAE has a ton of information on this. You really want to go back. They've put together a working group to answer all these sort of, and these sort of things, and they're, co and they're, uh, collating lots of, um, so they're acting sort of like a depository for all this type of information. So if you have a normal filter in your system, one of the things you can do um, is, uh, you know, introduce a MERV rated 13 or higher. So 13, 14 are pretty close in terms of their, their effectiveness. Uh, but you can only do this if it's feasible because sometimes you have capacity issues and there's too much of a, a, too much of a pressure drop over the filter to do that. So your system capacities. You don't want it to bypass your filter, so make sure it's properly fitted and secure in the housing, and, and you can also tape it um, that way. Um, you know, people will talk about, so air direction moving air is super important. We, we want to do that through negative pressure differences, so pressure management. Um, in a room, you could do standalone fans, but you've got to use this cautiously because, again, it, it could um, re-suspend uh, drop particles in the air and, and we certainly don't want that and we're and we don't want to be redirecting at uh, farther distances and, and that kind of uh, stuff if so you so typically your your normal air handling system keep it on constantly on this is good and it's got a good airflow um, it's going to be uh, helpful so we talk about um, you know you you know ultraviolet germicidal irradiation uh, using UVC um, um, uh, you know, that technology, um, and they see good things when you use that in combination with filters, you're, you're getting the same sort of performance as, a, as two to six air exchanges per hour. Um, I'm, I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on that beyond um, just sort of showing you that, you know, there's technology has been around for a long time. So you, you know, most recently people are seeing it with the disinfectant and reuse of respirators. But if you, you know, you have to do this and obviously in a safe way because there's ocular and and skin hazards associated with it. So no one's saying, go grab the device, put it in there. You go back to these standards and, and you work with the manufacturer to implement these if this is what you want to do. So surface disinfectant shown in the right. And it's if, you know, it, it, there's a lot of factors to consider in that. And I'm trying not to talk, get too far down that road talking about it, but I do want to sort of just introduce that as one of the things that, that's being promoted. And, and ASHRAE has spent a lot of time sort of um, integrating that into their set of standards. They've actually created a couple standards around it. It tends to be used um, not so much in the air duct handling uh, because it's hard because of the, it's the exposure time and the intensity. Um, but it, it, as the goes into the plenum here, they use it to, for microbial um, killing. And um, they also um, they are using it to kill any virus that could be stuck on the HEPA filter within the air handling unit. And then the other thing that they they have done, and they did this, you know, it's been around for 100 years or more, but they've been using this kind of technology for, you know, with TB and other infectious diseases. But, um, yeah, obviously, I'm not referring to TB being back 100 years ago, but I'm just saying that that this technology has been around and used in various formats. And, but this is an upper room uh, use of this where they're directing it specifically up the upper room and controlling the, the um, um, you know, the the, um, the 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 dose um, and it, and it's not going to control the droplet. It's just going to control whatever is in the top, and it's going to require various sort of mixing um, fans and things like that to help facilitate facilitate that. So so another thing that um, when we think about you know our ventilation indoors, um, there are times where you you want to you know surge capacity, you, or you've got a particular type of procedure or task where you've got a mobile point source but sometimes you know the person can actually you might be doing a procedure think about a an eye doctor who's in with a patient and, and they're or a dentist who you know they're close to the patient's face and they want to extract 
any potential droplets and airborne particles at the source. So using portable and fixed filtration units um, are a way to do that. At the top, I'm just showing you one um, housed in a, in a piece of um, housing there and then with a filter in the housing and then the flexible duct work attached to a, um, a bell-shaped hood. Uh, so you can do it um, as a local exhaust hood, but you know I've also I remember talking to one uh, um, doctor who's setting up his practice, and he has a different procedure he was doing where it involved a breathing a respiratory uh, breathing device, and so you could you could take this equipment and set up a specialized hood where the patients are actually you know using that equipment and drawing it away from um, you know, over the shoulders of, of the patient and, and out of the breathing zone of anybody that would be in the room. Um, we'll get to exp expedient uh, patient isolation rooms, but you can connect this equipment up in such a way that you can create negative spaces. Um, also, anti rooms, ventilated headboards. So, so what's a, an expedient patient isolation room? This is on CDC. Lots of research, a lot of information provided there. But essentially what you're doing is you're just establishing a high ventilation rate, um, creating negative pressure. So you think about a bed with some curtains around it in a patient room, you're replacing those curtains with you know, a, a, a thicker fire rated um, um, transparent uh, um, sheet, sheeting sheet of um, plastic. And so what you're, and you're hooking up a, a, one of these um, HEPA, portable HEPA filtration units to create negative pressure through this space. And so by doing that, what you're doing is just creating a contaminated zone or a dangerous zone or whatever you want to call it um, by around the patient, but then you're outside that space is a clean area where people could put on, potentially put on their PPE or, or they could still continue to do that in the hallway. And um, yeah, so um, NIOSH has developed uh, lots of research and guidance around this. Obviously, the the people who you know you have you couldn't use this particular setup for in a long term care home where you had someone with dementia who wasn't staying you know has they have to be uh, non mobile. Um, consider an effective solution for surge isolation capacity during outbreaks when traditional airborne isolations are not available. So if we go look back, we see all these documents existed, and here I'm just showing you. So here down in the middle, hopefully you can see my little mouse thing here. You got a HEPA filter. They've taped it uh, along where the bed, the the shower, not the um, the um, curtain would hang, and they've the red represents where they fixed it, and then you can you can temporarily remove it here. They they allow they they make it tight to the HEPA unit, so there's no mixing of air. It just it comes from both sides. So you got one two beds. Um, F is clean air. Um, and you know you're going to have your supply out here. You're going to draw air in, and this is where the, the, the healthcare workers could come in, and it comes across the bed. And then on this side, the same same sort of thing. And then clean air comes out of the HEPA, HEPA unit here. So you got some contaminated space, and then some um, some cleaner area here. So from clean to less clean, and then the hallway to the hall would be again clean to less clean. Uh, here we're seeing a two patient room, a typical one with the bathroom. Um, interestingly, this setup here is going across the, the the patient's head, across the pillow. They actually found that this was a much more effective uh, setup, um, and it did you didn't get that that build up in the um, around the feet or wherever. So it it immediately draws the across to the HEPA, HEPA filter, and they do factor in air flows to make sure it's comfortable and noise could be a, a consideration. But yeah, and then here they're they're coming in on this side. And it's being drawn across from corner to corner of that that space. Yeah, and I encourage you guys to always, you know, not always, but to go back and to go to these underlying documents and to read them. They're excellent. Some of them are like how-to documents on how to set this stuff up, but a lot of it is 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 showing the research and the science behind it and all the test methods and things that they used and all the data to support it. You can also use, so here you're seeing this gray unit with a flexible transparent duct hose and they're and they're setting up a temporary construction anteroom. You've seen this with um, construction within healthcare. So it's a similar sort of thing and there's lots of different configurations. So the abatement community is accustomed to, to doing that sort of thing. But this one's just, you know, quickly can be set up and moved around. Uh, here, the expedient patient room is just showing you this. Back here in the middle is the actual unit. 
Um, this should be taped down, so we're just seeing it at a different stage of it being set up. Um, but you want to, you know, seal that up, and you got to create sufficient space around around the, the patient. So this one's really interesting. Uh, it's a ventilated headboard. You can see it has a, this, you know, it could be made with wood or extruded aluminum um, uh, metal. Uh, this one here, you can, you can, um, it's a, it's a hood, right? And it, it's a canopy tile style, and you can see how the hood is retractable. This part pulls back. There's a manifold at the back, and then you don't see the ductwork and the HVAC unit, but it connects at the back. And they distribute evenly the airflow over these filters, so you've got an even distribution. So it uses local control technique for near instant capture, containment, before contaminants have a chance to disperse, protects the air and surrounding surfaces from contamination, allows low velocity air currents to, to capture and remove. Canopy easily retracts to allow hands-on healthcare, um, and then obviously it's held into place by removable uh, clips and easily replaced. So something like this, you know, it's it's really it's only going to cost you about um, the actual unit, the HEPA unit. You know, something like that might be anywhere from two to three thousand, and then some, building something like that is a matter of going to Home Depot and putting it together. CDC, NIOSH have got the how to to build these, you know, with PVC plumbing material or or uh, with uh, two by four lumber. So it, it's not a, it's not an expensive solution. Side profile over here, just saying, you know, you want the closer you you have uh, to the bed. And so you could, you know, adjust the, the, the legs with um, a certain type of design. And then again, this is just showing you another way to do this, where you're using a combination of the expedient patient isolation room, plus this um, ventilated headboard there. CDC has a, and NIOSH have a video of this. Um, I'm just showing you a, a picture from Oklahoma State Public Health document here. They don't have the retractable canopy. Um, all this stuff can be torn down and, and cleaned, and there's protocols on how to properly clean it as well. And here they're showing you the unit in the back there hooked up to the ventilated headboard and all the sort of testing equipment as part of their research into this. The back of it, and then here's another view showing the airflow. So it's kind of like a laboratory fume hood and trying to control the, the flow over it. You can also use this with emergency medical shelters and field hospitals. Um, the, you know, you can put a, fit it with a larger sized um, HEPA ventilation unit. And um, again, all the specifications are provided. You could see how this was in a big conference, a big um, space, like the inside of, of an arena. You know, this sort of thing could be easily uh, set up. In terms of other types of local devices, uh, this one, um, you know, I saw, I saw this when I thought of Kevin with, you know, on my, my uh, mate from Australia there. Uh, this was a, a real collaboration between researchers and the local Western Health um, you know, network, but they designed a personal ventilation hood. And so, you know, obviously you can't use this in every scenario, but it, it requires you know, not, the patient not to be claustrophobic or to be uh, okay with this particular setup. But again, like it less reliance on the PPE and more containment of any potential aerosols. And then uh, finally, um, here just showing an improvement on that initial um, droplet, you know, intubation box. Uh, this one is hooked up to uh, HEPA filter housing, so they put the HEPA there and they draw the air out. And um, this was a, again another collaboration between an army researcher and a and a you know an uh, anesthetist that worked in a, a local hospital in the. Uh, Peterborough area. Right now, we're um, we're close to putting this out, and it's just a checklist. Not a ch actually, it's not a checklist. It's it's showing the hierarchy of control, different examples. Um, so I focus more mainly on the engineering, but this gives you a, a sort of a full sort of summary or examples of of different controls based on the hierarchy. And what we've done here is is sort of checked off contact droplet airborne. You know, is it going to be able to help and contribute to that particular route of transmission? Right, so some are better than others, and and this is sort of what we want to stress is think about the hierarchy, but also think about the modes modes of transmission, and then using them in combination. So yeah, so that's my uh, presentation. Great, thank you, Neil. A lot of um, very interesting and exciting ideas in there. Um, I all right. Running along there. That's okay. That's good. It's, uh, like I said, a lot of good information and great ideas. So it was good to see them. 
All right, thank you. Next up, we have Sandra Jones. Sandy has been in RPN for 38 years, working in all three sectors, long-term care, community, and hospital. She's been an active advocate for health and safety in the workplace, obtaining level one and level two provincial health and safety certification. She was also a steward and part of the Joint Health and Safety Committee of the hospital. In May of 2019, she was nominated and received the Barry and District Labor Council Workers Health and Safety Award. Sandy recently left working in the hospital sector to become an internal organizer with SEIU Healthcare and is part of the nursing division working on development of resources and tools for our nurses. Thank you and over to Sandy. Thank you, Patricia. I'd like to say that I'm truly honored to be part of this amazing team um, who are dedicated to promoting health and safety for all of our workers here. Today, I'd like to talk about the point of care risk assessment. The point of care risk assessment empowers the healthcare worker to decide what appropriate actions or PPE required to minimize the risk of you, your patient, and others. Sorry, Sandy, can you share your screen? See it? Not yet. Let's see here. There we go. It's coming up. Okay, good. And then if you just put it into slide presentation mode, we can yeah, see sure. it. Okay. Perfect. So once again, thank you for that. Once again, um, the idea of the point of care risk assessment or the PCRA is to minimize the risk to you, your patient and others based on your assessment of the infection transmission risk. While the PCRA is not a new concept, but it's one that is performed regularly by our healthcare workers. When we're talking about the point of care risk assessment, there are three factors to consider. The patient, the activity, and the environment. Let's start by looking at the patient. Is the patient able to follow instructions? What are the patient's symptoms? What is the level of the patient's cognition? Are they able to understand and cooperate are they able to follow instructions? For example, someone who has a cognitive impairment, such as dementia, may not be able to follow through with instructions given. Is the patient able to wear a mask? Again, example, someone with dementia might not understand why they need to wear the mask and would highly likely pull it off. So the decision there would be to strongly consider the need to replace a surgical or procedure mask with at least an N95 respirator. And of course, a gown, gloves, face shield. The next thing to consider is the activity that you are actually going to perform with your patient. What is the degree of contact or contamination or aerosol exposure? What's the degree of difficulty of the procedure being performed? What actions are needed to eliminate or limit the infectious dose? Will you be performing an activity that may induce significant resp respiratory secretions that can't be contained, such as coughing? AGMPs are often discussed and certainly the need when you're performing an aerosol generating mechanism that you have a high level of N95. AGMPs can be referred to things like CPR, a bronchoscopy, sputum induction, tracheostomy care, nebulized therapy, aerosol medication administration, or patients on high oxygen flow. Earlier, we talked about the possibility of applying the precautionary principle. If you feel that you are performing an activity that would definitely promote coughing and sneezing, you must replace the surgical mask with at least an N95 respirator or higher. 
And again, protecting your clothing and wearing a gown, face shield, goggles, and gloves. The last part to take a look at is the environment. How do we limit staff patient occupancy with interaction? What are the modes of transmission and potential risks of exposure to blood and other bodily fluids? Is the ventilation adequate? Will care be provided outside the regular patient's room where they're being isolated? For example, are you taking the patient through a hallway to be taken to a test? Are they in public areas, outpatient unit, non-traditional or leased environment? It's important to consider the need to replace a surgical or procedure mask with at least the N95 respirator. And again, choosing to wear a gown, face shield, gloves for protection. These are the three factors that you must take into consideration. And remember, your clinical judgment, along with your PCRA, determines the level of PPE required to provide safe care for you, your patient, and others. It's important as nurses too to consider your three-factor framework. It's important that we all consider our levels of skill and knowledge and judgment when you're performing your PCRA. Remember, we don't go to work not to be safe. We must advocate for the appropriate PPE. So I thank you very much. Be safe out there. Thank you, Patricia. All right, great. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, so we're going to open up for question and answers now. Um, we have had several questions throughout uh, in our comments section, so I will go through there go through those in case there are any uh, additional responses to those questions. And uh, we also have the opportunity now, if you uh, would like to unmute yourself to ask a question, uh, you will be able to do that as well. So we'll start first. Is there anybody online that would like to unmute and ask a question? All right. So let's go to the questions. We'll start from the beginning. Um, these questions came under uh, when John was presenting. So from Dorothy Wigmore, uh, no cleaning folks were infected in the survey, John, but they have been elsewhere and some have died. Any idea why the difference? Well, first of all, uh, we only had a few um, people respond to the survey who were cleaners. So I, I think there were less than 100. So it just happened that those uh, Hundred uh, did not uh, have infections. So uh, overall, uh, the percentage of people being infected was less than one percent of the respondents. So any group that had less than a hundred, uh, we may or may not have had a single case. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question for you, John, from uh, Sheldon Higginson. Uh, on your list of jobs, you said RPN, registered psychiatric nurse. Uh, he wants to know, are you sure it's not registered practical nurse? There's a big difference in the risk of exposure from patients involved. Yes, we looked at it very closely. We asked people to describe uh, what they did as a job and also their workplace and that. So when we coded it into the categories, we were very careful not to uh, mix up RPN with LPN. Uh, because different provinces also uh, named them differently. So, so in some provinces, it's LPN, in other provinces, it's RPN. So we were very careful in making uh, those separations. Okay, great, thank you. All right, just wanna go back. I saw a couple of people look like they were on video and unmuting. Were there some questions online? Not right now, okay. So Kevin, we had a few questions for you as well. From Julia Locke, how is extended periods defined right now? And uh, that was in reference to the aerosol exposure near the beginning of your presentation. Um, if um, if we're talking about um, you know 
the infectious dose, um, you know, the amount of time you need to be exposed to coronavirus before it becomes a risk. Um, sometimes they use 15 minutes, um, 15 minutes is used, but, you know, it, I sort of have a bit of a problem with that because you could, there could be more than one person close to you. You could be closer to the person, but it is still a measure. Um, so 15 minutes is used, but um, I don't know if John wants to comment on that. I know he's talked about the 15 minute rule as well. Yeah. It, okay. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, you know, you can have a high concentration of virus in the air, or you can have a low concentration. 15 minutes of a high concentration might be equivalent to a five or five minute uh, exposure to a high concentration of uh, virus might be equivalent to a half an hour of a low concentration. So um, also um, the body sometimes reacts differently if it has a high dose uh, exposure in a short period of time, whereas a, a low dose may be more manageable uh, for the um, the uh, defense mechanisms in, in the lungs. So there's a lot of factors in there and it's hard to come up with a, a hard and fast rule. So the 15 minutes was kind of a rule of thumb that was devised quite early in China during the experience and it's kind of stuck, uh, but it, there, there's not a, a whole lot of science behind it. It's just, um, they just noticed that anybody who spent less than 15 minutes didn't get infected whereas those who spent more than 15 minutes uh, had a higher rate of infection. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John and Kevin. Um, it looks like Julia has a follow-up question to that. Uh, follow-up with the extended time. Is the infectious dose established right now? Uh, there's still work being done on that. Um, um, so. The video that I provided to Lisa Brosu's um, presentation um, talks about the infectious dose, and she does provide some examples of how long it takes to um, get to, to, to reach an infectious dose. But obviously, um, you know, if, if you're in a poorly ventilated area, then it's going to take less time to reach the um, infectious dose. So. You know, it's not it's not a simple. It, it's hard to apply a simple algorithm. Um, you really need to look at all the different risk factors, including the ventilation and how close a person is, and um, how much what the exposure time is. Um, and you know, I guess with the more detailed risk assessment, um, it's really important to involve a an occupational hygienist to really go through the different factors. Um, from exposure. And uh, so uh, we're actually, um, so Lisa Brosu will be also presenting at a symposia that we're working on putting together. And we hopefully we're going to drill down and sort of look at a more detailed kind of risk assessment where we can look more closely at infectious dose um, as, as we move forward. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, just quickly for Jessica, yes, the webinar has been recorded uh, and it will be posted along with the presenter's slide decks uh, in the next week or so on the OCAL website. Okay, Kevin, we had another question for you from uh, Dorothy Wigmore. Uh, how do we introduce or talk about hazard while there's so much about risk these days? It really matters for OHS in general. For sure, hazard doesn't equal risk. I just want to make that very clear. Um, you know, hazard is something that has the potential to cause harm. Um, as soon as you actually get close to that hazard and you're exposed, then that hazard, you know, it's the hazard, the, the, the likelihood of causing harm and the exposure together, that's what, what the risk is. So, um, you know, it, there's a lot of confusion about the difference between hazard and risk. Hazard does not equal risk. Um, hazard can cause harm but you really need to be exposed. And then obviously with the coronavirus, um, the more that you're exposed and you know, the, the higher the infectious dose, um, the greater the risk. I don't know if that answers the question, Dorothy. Did you want to re reply to that or is, is, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, Dorothy, if you want to come off mute, you certainly can. Um, 
We don't hear anything. All right. So, okay, that's that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, just quickly, we'll go over to online again. Any additional questions uh, for Kevin at this time? All right, great. Thank you. Uh, oh. oh, John is responding. Okay. Uh, Neil, we have a few questions for you as well from your presentation from Nancy Johnson. With airborne COVID, shouldn't employers be careful about putting up temporary plexiglass barriers because it may impact on ventilation? And isn't it important to have efficient ventilation moving the contaminant out quickly? Yeah, so it's really going to. Um, so thanks, Nancy, for that question. It it's hard to go into all the details and all the different scenarios, but in in some cases, that's very much true. Um, that was you know that one um, inhalation box. Um, Sorry, the um, the partition that I showed while the person was doing the assessment, that was one of the things I was trying to draw to draw attention to. So, and so in some cases you do want that air circulation and others um, there is sufficient. So let's say you had a supply and exhaust and two separate on either side of a partition, then you would be fine. Um, but you're right there in some cases, what happens is, is you, you block the airflow and then you get this stale air, you get these sort of dead spots and you don't get the same level of mixing. Now with, if you introduced 100% fresh air, um, that would be positive, but we can't always do that. Um, there is a certain trade-off. If you don't, if you do 100% of fresh air, then you're not really doing, putting, recirculating any air across the filter. So you're not getting any benefit there. So the, there's trade-offs bet between those those two. Um, so I I think it you know instead of um, it's best I think that to in order to answer a question like that we would we would really want to know the specific scenario and then work your way through it. But that's but that's exactly the role of an industrial hygienist. And I agree with Kevin and his points earlier that you know this we really need to we've got hygienists across the province that are. You know, this is their job. This is what they do. This is this is an opportunity to really engage them around these sorts of questions. Um, but you draw you do draw attention to an excellent point that you know some of these things have to be done cautiously, and we can't just like certainly I don't want you to take what I said today as sort of a blanket approach. Uh, they have to be in proper context. So thanks for that, Nancy. Okay, thank you, Neil. Uh, we have another question for you from David. He asks about cold plasma technology for air purification instead of the more risky UV. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't, um, I'm not an expert in any of these technologies, to be completely honest. I, you know, I've got a certain level of knowledge as a hygienist, but I, I would say, you know, every, any technology comes with its, its risks and limitations and there's trade-offs. And they have to be used in a proper context within the, the, you know, within standards and regulatory requirements and all that kind of stuff. So it is true that, you know, that there is a hazard, but, you know, that whole concept about hazard and risk, if you, if you implement these things, understanding the science and doing them properly, um, you know, there is a way to do this so that the risk is, is, is reduced. So, so, you know, I was doing some reading over the last few days about, um, you know, ultraviolet, you know, looking at ASHRAE, they have a whole chapter in their ventilation book, and it was going through this and really speaking to this point. So, you know, there are hazards and risks that we obviously we know about it, but they, they certainly, you know, ASHRAE has, you know, for the last um, 10 years has, um, I guess they started a work uh, a task force back in like 2004. They put a committee together in 2010, and then ever since, you know, they they brought them in board into into that, and and they really have, um, you know, looked had brought the expertise to the table and started creating standards around it. So so I think it has to be in proper context, and and certainly we don't want people grabbing the technology and then just start using it. Um, again, you have to. I would say involve hygienists, but also you know HVAC experts and others researchers in in this area to to get their knowledge. So Ashray, go to Ashray. They have all this stuff up on their website, and you can read about it and and get further educated on that technology. Great, thank you, Neil. Sure. Um, 
All right, so back to online. Any additional questions uh, for Neil? I do see your question there, Nancy. We will get to that too. But any additional questions? Anybody want to come off mute? Can, I, right. can I say something, um, Patricia? Um, Kevin. I'll, get, I'll get back to Nancy's question. Um, but just um, so Kimberly's in the chat box is talking about a symposia that we're going to be presenting. And so the first session, um, uh, Dr. Raymond Tellier is going to be hosting the session and the speakers are going to be Dr. Lindsay Meyer, Dr. John Connolly and Dr. Donald Milton. So really there's going to be about, you know, it's really talking about the science of transmission with, with you know, really well-known experts. Um, and there's also a second session that I'm going to be hosting, which is going to be looking more at the hierarchy of control. And Lisa Bross, who's agreed to be part of that session as well. So I just want to bring everyone's attention to that. Um, it's between the July July the seventh to the ninth, twelve thirty to two thirty, um, and uh, it's uh, not next week, the week after. So to, just to Nancy's question, um, you know, the whole idea around um, aerosol, aerosolized generating procedures or medical procedures, you know, as soon as you, people come in close contact with somebody um, that's a, you know may have COVID-19, they need to wear a respirator, not a surgical mask, a respirator. And that person needs to be part, you know, that, that person needs to be fit tested. And if there are um, AGMPs, you know, the, the risk is higher and possibly the ventilation's not good. We really need to think about a much higher level of respirators, such as a powered air purifying respirator. respirator. So, you know, and I was talking to Sandy about this earlier, um, the locking, Ascent to AGMPs is sort of a bit misleading because people can transmit the virus just from coughing or you know talking loudly. So I just I, if that's the message I want to I just want to leave with everyone. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Kevin. So if you uh, just check in the chat box there, you will see um, some of the links to the um, presentations that Kevin was speaking about coming up um, and do keep an eye on the OCA website and while we're over in the chat box uh, I just want to point everybody's eye as well to our short survey once um, once we've completed the webinar there's a link in there if you could uh, take the time to do the survey it would really help us out thank you okay so, yes oh, sorry there's just one more thing that I forgot to say um, we're also looking for success stories um, so, you know, with the symposia, are you, do you want to talk to that, Kimberly? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's it, it, totally fine. I just didn't want to miss it. So we're, we're pleading to all of you, thank you for joining and thank you to our wonderful presenters uh, for this upcoming series. Looking for success stories and innovation, similar to what Neil spoke to today um, on healthcare, but we're looking for success stories uh, from construction, from all the sectors, food chain, from ag processing to point of sale, transport, manufacturing, retail, um, you know, uh, tell your friends, uh, spread the word. Uh, and if um, I can, I can put my email in the, the chat window. Um, if uh, people would like to contact uh, me or any one of our speakers uh, for ideas for our success stories and innovations would be wonderful. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Kimberly and Kevin. So we do have a few more questions um, from Sandy's uh, portion of the presentation. So Sandy, for you, from uh, Sheldon Higginson, what are your thoughts on nasal swabs being removed from the list of aerosol generating procedures? And Sandy, up to you, or if uh, any of the hygienists want to answer. I think that, again, we have to trust the assessment of the worker. Um, sometimes when you're performing those swabs, it can cause somebody to cough in your face and the proximity that you are in, to actually perform the act is a consideration. Um, whether it makes the list or not, I don't have um, any, any ideas about that, but what I can speak to is you have the right as a worker to perform your PCRA to determine what level of risk you are being exposed to. It's a good opportunity to talk to your Joint Health and Safety Committee as well to formulate a better plan depending on where these swabs are being done because some of them are being done outside and drive throughs and whatnot. So consider that. Um, yeah, Kevin, did you want to have anything to say about that? Sure, I just want to uh, put this message out there. A surgical mask isn't a respirator. 
um, a respirator is designed to fit the face and you have it like fit tested so it's you know it provides um, proper personal protection um, a surgical mask may provide a bit of press protection more for droplets and as a barrier but please don't be fooled when they give you a surgical mask and tell you that um, it's going to offer the same level of protection as a respirator. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Sandy. Um, so that brings us, it's 3.30, brings us to the uh, end of our questions. Um, I'll just quickly ask before we go, are there any additional questions online? Anybody wants to come off of uh, mute? Okay, if you do have any additional questions, please feel free to type them in um, and we will, and if you leave your email, we will get back to you um, with the with the response. So thank you everybody and I want to say thank you very much to our presenters. They did a wonderful job, a lot of fantastic information. We appreciate the collaboration today. Thank you everybody.